case, already a pretty good model after three minutes, right? So, so when you first start doing this, you might find it a bit, it's like annoying that your first models take four hours more or more to create that language model. But the key thing to remember is you only have to do that once for your entire kind of domain of stuff that you're interested in. Um, and then you can build lots of different classifiers and other models on top of that in a few minutes. Okay? Um, right, so we can save that to make sure we don't have to run it again. Um, and then here's something interesting. I'm going to explain this more um, in just a few minutes. Um, I'm not going to say unfreeze. Instead I'm going to say freeze two. And what that says is unfreeze the last two layers. Don't unfreeze the whole thing. And so we've just found it really helps with these um, text classification, not to unfreeze the whole thing, but to unfreeze one layer at a time. So unfreeze the last two layers, train it a little bit more, unfreeze the next layer again, train it a little bit more, unfreeze the whole thing, train it a little bit more. You'll also see I'm passing in this thing momentums equals 0 0.8, 0 0.7. We're going to learn exactly what that means. Um, in the next week or two, probably next week. Um, but for now, um, uh, and we may even automate it, so maybe by the time you watch the video of this, this won't even be necessary any, anymore. Um, right, basically, we found for um, training recurrent neural networks, RNNs, um, it really helps to decrease the momentum a little bit. So that's what that is. Um, so that gets us a 94.4 uh, accuracy after about half an hour or less of training, um, actually quite a lot less, of training the actual classifier. Um, and uh, we can actually get this quite a bit better for, for, with a few tricks. I don't know if we'll learn all the tricks. Um, this part, it might be next part, but even this very simple kind of standard approach um, is pretty great. Um, if we compare it to uh, last year's uh, state of the art, uh, on IMDB, this is from the uh, Cove paper from um, McCann et al. at Salesforce Research. Um, their paper uh, was 91.8% accurate. Uh, in the best paper they could find, they found a fairly domain-specific sentiment analysis uh, paper from 2017 that got 94.1. Um, and here, we've got 94.4. Uh, and the best models I've been able to build since have been about 95, 95.1. Um, so if you're looking to do text classification, this, you know, really st standardized transfer learning approach um, works, works super well. Any questions, Rachel? Uh, okay, so uh, that, was, um, that was NLP, and we'll be learning more about NLP later in this course. Um, but now I wanted to switch over and look at um, Tabula. Now, tabular data is pretty interesting because it's the stuff that, um, for a lot of you, is actually what you use day to day at work in, in spreadsheets, in relational databases. Just come close, I guess. All right. So, where does the magic number of 2.6 to the fourth in the learning rate come from? Yeah, good question. So, the learning rate is various, various things divided by 2.6 to the fourth. Um, the reason it's to the fourth, uh, you will learn about at the, about the end of today. Uh, so let's focus on the 2.6. Why 2.6? Um, basically, um, this, as we're, as we're going to see in more detail later today, this, this number, the difference between the bottom of the slice and the top of the slice is basically what's the difference between how quickly the lowest layer of the model learns versus the highest layer of the model learns. Um, so this is called discriminative learning rates. And so really the question is like, as you go from layer to layer, how much do I decrease the learning rate by? And we found out that for NLP RNNs, that the answer is 2.6. How do we find out that it's 2.6? Um, I ran um, lots and lots of different models, um, uh, like a year ago or so, uh, using lots of different sets of hyperparameters of various types, dropout, learning rates, and you know, discriminative learning rate, and so forth. And then I created um, something called a random forest, which is a kind of model where I attempted to predict how accurate my NLP classifier would be based on the hyperparameters. 
Um, and then I um, used random forest interpretation methods to basically figure out um, what the optimal parameter settings were, and I found out that the answer for this number was 2.6. Um, so that's actually not something I've published, uh, or I don't think I've even talked about it before, so there's a new piece of information. You can, um, um, actually, a few months after I did this, um, uh, I think Stephen Merity and somebody else uh, did publish a paper describing a similar approach, so the, the basic idea may be out there already. Um, some of that idea comes from um, a researcher named Frank Hutter um, and one of his collaborators. Uh, they did some um, interesting work showing how you can use random forests to actually find optimal hyperparameters. Um, so it's kind of a, a neat trick. Um, you know, a lot of people are very interested in this thing called auto ML, which is this idea of like building models to figure out how to train your model. Um, we're not big fans of it on the whole, um, but we, we do find that building models to better understand how your hyperparameters work and then finding like those rules of thumb, like, oh, basically it can always be 2.6, um, quite helpful. Um, so that's just something we're kind of been playing with. Okay, so, um, yeah, so let's talk about tabular data. So um, tabular data, um, uh, such as you might see in a, in a spreadsheet or a relational database, you know, or a financial report, um, it can contain um, all kinds of different things. Um, uh, it can contain all kinds of different things, and I kind of tried to make a little list of some of the kinds of things that I've seen um, uh, tabular data analysis um, used for. Um, Using neural nets for analyzing tabular data is, um, or at least last year when I first presented this, uh, was, did we start, maybe we started this two years ago. Anyway, when we first presented this, um, people were deeply skeptical and they thought it was a terrible idea to use neural nets to analyze tabular data because like everybody knows that you should use logistic regression or random forests or gradient boosting machines, uh, all of which have their place for certain, certain types of things. Um, but since that time, um, you know, um, it's become clear that the commonly held wisdom is, um, is wrong. It's not true that neural nets are not useful for tabular data. Um, in fact, they're extremely useful. And we've shown this in, in quite a few of our courses. Um, but what's really kind of also helped is that um, a some really uh, effective organizations have started publishing papers and posts and stuff describing how they've been using neural nets for analyzing tabular data. Um, one of the key things that comes up again and again is that although feature engineering doesn't go away, it certainly becomes simpler, right? So Pinterest, for example, replaced the gradient boosting machines that they were using to decide how to um, put stuff on their homepage with neural nets. And uh, they presented at a conference this approach and they described how it really made engineering a lot easier because a lot of the hand-created features weren't necessary anymore. You still need some, but it was just simpler, right? So they ended up with something that was more accurate, um, but perhaps even more importantly, it required less maintenance, right? Um, so I wouldn't say you know, it's the only tool that you need in your toolbox for analyzing tabular data, but you know, where else, I used to use random forests 99% of the time when I was doing machine learning with tabular data. I, I now use neural nets 90% of the time. Um, it, it's, it's, it's kind of my standard first go-to approach now, and it tends to be um, pretty reliable, pretty effective. Um, one of the things that's made it difficult is that until now, there hasn't been an easy way to kind of create and train tabular neural nets, like nobody's really made it available in a library. Um, so we've actually just created um, fastai.tabular, and I think this is pretty much the first time that it's become really easy to, to use um, neural nets with tabular data. Um, so let me show you how easy it is. Um, this is actually coming directly from the um, examples folder in the fastai repo. I haven't changed it at all. Um, and as per usual, as well as importing fastai, you should uh, import your application. So in this case, it's tabular. Um, we assume that your data is in a pandas data frame, 
Um, a pandas data frame is kind of the standard format for tabular data in Python, and it's lots of ways to get it in there, but probably the most common might be pd.readcsv. Um, but, you know, whatever your data's in, you can probably get it into a pandas data frame easily enough. Okay, hit me with the question. What are the 10% of cases where you would not default to neural nets? Um, good question. Um, I guess I still tend to kind of give them a try. Um, but, um, yeah, I don't know. It's, 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 it's kind of like, uh, as you do things for a while, you start to get a sense of, of, of the areas where things don't quite work as well. I have to think about that during the week. I don't think I have a rule of thumb. But I would say, you may as well try both. Like, I would say, try a random forest and try a neural net. They're both pretty quick and easy to run and see how it looks. Um, and if they're roughly similar, I might try and dig into each and see if I can make them better and better. But, you know, if the random forest is doing way better, I'd probably just stick with that, um, use whatever works. Um, so I um, currently have the wrong notebook um, in the lesson repo, so uh, I'll update it after the class. So sorry about that. So we start with the um, data in a data frame, um, and so uh, we've got a... Um, uh, little thing, uh, adult sample, it's a, it's a classic old data set. I'll have to dig up the citation for it because I've got to put it in this, um, in this notebook. Um, it's a, but it's a pretty small, simple, uh, old data set that's good for experimenting with, basically. Um, and it's a CSV file, so you can read it into a data frame with pandas.readcsv, pd.readcsv. If your, um, uh, data is in a relational database, pandas can read from that. If it's in Spark or Hadoop, pandas can read from that. Pandas can read from most stuff um, that you can throw at it. Um, so that's why we kind of use it as a default starting point. Um, and as per usual, you know, it's, uh, I think it's nice to use the data block uh, API. Um, and so um, in this case, the list that we're trying to create is a tabular list, and we're going to create it from a data frame. And so you can tell it what the data frame is and what the path that you're going to use to kind of save models and intermediate steps is. And then you need to tell it what are your categorical variables and what are your continuous variables. So we're going to be learning a lot more about what that means to the neural net um, next week. Um, but for now, uh, the quick summary is this. Um, your independent variables are the things that you're using to make predictions with, right? So things like education and marital status and age and so forth. Um, some of those variables, uh, like age, are basically numbers. They could be any number, you know. You could be 13.36 years old or 19.4 years old or whatever. Whereas things like marital status are um, options that can be selected from a discrete group. Um, Married, single, divorce, whatever. Sometimes those options might be quite a lot more, like occupation, there's a lot of possible occupations. Um, and sometimes they might be binary, could be just true or false. But anything which um, you can select the, the answer from a small group of possibilities is called a categorical variable. And so we're going to need to use a different approach in the neural net to modeling categorical variables to what we use for continuous variables. For categorical variables, we're going to be using something called embeddings, which we'll be learning about um, later today. Uh, for continuous variables, uh, they can just be sent into the neural net just like pixels in a neural net can, because like pixels in a neural net are already numbers. Uh, these continuous things are already numbers as well. Um, so that's, that's easy. Okay. So that's why you have to tell um, the... Um, uh, tabular list uh, from data frame, uh, which ones are, are which. Um, there are some other ways to do that by pre-processing them in pandas um, to make things categorical variables, but it's kind of nice to have one API for doing everything. You don't have to think too much about it. Um, then we've got something which is a lot like transforms um, in um, 
uh, in computer vision. Uh, transforms in computer vision do things like uh, flip uh, a photo on its axis, or turn it a bit, or brighten it, or normalize it. Um, but for um, tabular data, instead of having um, transforms, we have things called processes. And uh, they're nearly identical, but the key difference, which is quite important, is that a processor is something that happens ahead of time, right? So we basically pre-process the data frame uh, rather than doing it um, as we go, right? So um, transformations are really for data augmentation, where you want to like randomize it and do it differently each time, whereas processes are things that you want to do once ahead of time. So we um, have a number of um, processes in the FastAI library, um, and the ones we're going to use this time are fill missing, so that's going to look for um, uh, missing values and uh, deal with them some way. Um, um, we're going to find categorical variables and uh, turn them into pandas categories, and we're going to do normalization ahead of time, which is to take continuous variables and um, uh, subtract their mean and divide it by them by their standard deviation, so they're um, zero, one, um, uh, variables. Um, the way we deal with missing um, data, we'll talk more about um, next week, um, but in short, we replace it with a median and add a new column, which is a binary column of saying wh whether that was missing or not. Um, normalization, there's an important thing here, which is, in fact, for all of these things, um, whatever you do to the um, uh, training set, you need to do exactly the same thing to the validation set and the test set. So um, whatever you replaced your missing values with, you need to replace them with exactly the same thing in the validation set. So FastAI handles all these details for you. They're the kinds of things that if you have to do it manually, at least if you're like me, you'll screw it up um, lots of times until you finally get it right. Um, so that's what these um, processes are here. Um, then we're going to split into um, training uh, versus validation sets, and in this case we do it by providing a, um, a list of indexes, so the index is from 800 to 1000. Um, it's very common, I don't quite remember the details of this data set, but it's very common for wanting to keep your validation sets to be contiguous groups of things, like if they're map tiles, they should be the map tiles that are next to each other, um, if they're time periods, they should be time period, you know, days that are next to each other. If they're video frames, they should be video frames next to each other, because otherwise you're kind of cheating, right? Um, so it's often a good idea to use split by IDX and to grab a, a, a range that's next to each other if your data has some kind of structure like that, or find some other way to structure it in that way. All right, so that's now given us a training and a validation set. We now need to add labels. And in this case, the labels can come straight from the data frame we grabbed earlier, so we just have to tell it which column it is. And so the dependent variable is, I think it's whether um, they're making over $50,000 uh, salary. That's the thing we're trying to predict in this case. Um, we'll talk about test sets later, um, but in this case we can add a test set. Um, and finally get our data bunch. So at that point, we have something that looks like this. Okay, so there is our um, there is our data. Uh, and then to use it, um, it looks very familiar. Um, you get a learner, in this case it's a tabular learner, passing in the data, some information about your architecture, and some metrics, and you then call fit. You had some questions? All right, let's hit the questions. How to combine NLP tokenized data with metadata, such as tabular data, with fast AI? For instance, for IMBD classification, how to use information like who the actors are, year, may, genre, etc. Yeah, we're not quite up to that yet, um, so we need to learn a little bit more about how neural net architectures well work. Uh, and, but um, conceptually. It's kind of the same as the way we combine categorical variables and continuous variables. Basically, in the neural network, you can have uh, two different sets of inputs um, merging together into some layer. Could go into an early layer or into a later layer. It kind of depends. If it's like text and an image and some metadata, you probably want the text going into an RNN, the image going into a CNN, 
uh, the metadata going into some kind of tabular model like this, and then you'd have them basically all concatenated together and then go through some fully connected layers um, and train them end to end. Um, we'll probably largely get into that in part two. In fact, we might entirely get into that into part, part two. I'm not sure if we'll have time to cover it in, in part one. Uh, but conceptually, uh, it's, it's a fairly simple extension of what we'll be learning in the next three weeks. Next question is, do you think things like scikit-learn and xgBoost will eventually become outdated? Will everyone use deep learning tools in the future except for maybe small data sets? Um, I have no idea. I'm not good at making predictions. I, um, uh, I'm not a machine learning model. Um, I mean, xgBoost is a really nice piece of software. Um, there's quite a few really nice pieces of software for gradient boosting in particular. Um, uh, they have some really nice features, or actually Random Forest in particular has some really nice features for interpretation, which I'm sure we'll find similar versions for neural nets, but they don't necessarily exist yet. Um, so I don't know. For now, um, they're, they're both useful tools. Um, Scikit-learn. Uh, you know, uh, is a library that's uh, often used for kind of pre-processing and running models. Um, yeah, I mean, again, it's it's hard to predict where things will end up. It's it's kind of in some ways it's more focused on some older approaches to modeling. Um, but I don't know. They keep on adding new things, so we'll see. Um, I keep trying to incorporate more scikit-learn stuff into fast AI, and then I keep finding ways I think I can do it better and I throw it away again. So um, so that's why there's still no scikit-learn dependencies in fast AI. I um, keep finding other ways to do stuff. Uh, okay, so um, we're going to learn what layers equals means uh, either towards the end of class today or the start of class next week, but this is where we're basically defining our architecture, just like when we chose ResNet 34 or whatever um, for ConvNets. Um, we'll look at more about metrics in a moment, but just to remind you, metrics are just the things that get printed out. They don't change our model at all. So in this case, we're saying I want you to print out the accuracy to see how we're doing. Um, okay, so that's how to do um, tabular. This is going to work really well because we're going to hit our break soon, and the idea was that after three and a half lessons, we're going to hit the end of uh, all of the quick overview of applications, and then we're going to go down the other side. I think we're going to be to the minute we're going to hit it, right? Because the next one is collaborative filtering. Okay, so collaborative filtering um, is where you have information about um, who bought what or who liked what. You know, it's basically something where you have um, something like a, a user or a reviewer or whatever, um, and information about what they've bought or what they've written about or what they've reviewed, right? So in the most basic version of collaborative filtering, um, you just have two columns, something like, user ID and movie ID, and that just says this user bought that movie, this user bought that movie, this user bought that movie. So for example, Amazon has a really big list of user IDs and product IDs of like, what did you buy? Then you can add additional information to that uh, table, such as, oh, they left a review. What review did they give it? So it's now like user ID, movie ID, number of stars. Um, you could add a time code, so like, this user bought this product at this time and gave it this review. But they're all basically this same kind of structure. So there's kind of like two ways you could draw that collaborative filtering structure. Um, one is kind of a two-column approach where you've got like user and, I don't know, movie, right? And you've got user ID, movie ID, user, you know, each, each pair basically describes that user watched that movie, possibly also plus number of stars, you know, three, four, one, whatever. Um, well, the other way that you could write it would be you could have like all the users down here and all the movies 
along here, right? And um, and then um, you know you can look and find a particular cell in there to find out, you know. Uh, could be the rating of that user for that movie, or there's just a one there if that user watched that movie or whatever. So there's like two different ways of representing the same information. Um, conceptually, um, it's often easier to think of it this way, right? But most of the time you won't store it that way explicitly because most of the time you'll have what's called a very sparse matrix, which is to say most users haven't watched most movies, or most customers haven't purchased most products. So if you store it as a matrix where every combination of customer and product is a separate cell in that matrix, it's going to be enormous. So you tend to store it like this, or you can store it as a matrix using some kind of special sparse matrix format. And if that sounds interesting, you should check out Rachel's computational linear algebra course on fast AI where we have lots and lots and lots of information about sparse matrix storage approaches. Um, for now though, we're just going to kind of keep it in this format on the left hand side. So for collaborative filtering, uh, there's a, a really uh, nice um, data set called MovieLens. Um, uh, created by the group lens group, um, very helpfully, and you can download various different sizes, 20 million um, ratings, 100,000 ratings. Um, we've actually created a, a, an extra small version for playing around with, which is what we'll start with today, and then uh, um, probably next week uh, we'll use the bigger version. Um, uh, but so you can grab the small version using um, urls.ml sample. And uh, it's a CSV, so you can read it with pandas. Um, and um, here it is, right? It's basically a list of user IDs. We don't actually know anything about who these users are. There's some movie IDs. Um, uh, there is some information about what the movies are, but we won't look at that until next week. Um, and then there's the rating, and then there's the, the timestamp. Uh, we're going to ignore the timestamp for now. Um, so uh, that's a subset of our data that's the head. So the head in pandas is just the first few rows. Um, uh, so now that we've got a data frame, I mean the nice thing about collaborative filtering is, is it's, it's incredibly simple, like that's all the data that we need. So you can now go ahead and say get collaborative learner and you can actually just pass in the data frame directly. Um, the, the architecture, you have to tell it how many factors you want to use, and we're going to learn what that means after the break. Um, and then something that can be helpful is to tell it uh, what the range of scores are, and we're going to see how that helps after the break as well. Uh, so in this case, the minimum score is zero, the maximum score is five. Um, so now that you've got a learner, uh, you can go ahead and call um, fit one cycle. Um, and trains for a few epochs, and there it is. So at the end of it, you now have something where you can pick a user ID and a movie ID and guess whether or not that user will like that movie. Um, there's a lot of, um, so this is obviously a super useful application that a, a lot of you are probably going to try over the, during the week in past classes. A lot of people have taken this collaborative filtering approach back to their workplaces um, at, and discovered that using it in practice is much more tricky than this because in practice you have something called the cold start problem. So the cold start problem is that the time you particularly want to be good at recommending movies is when you have a new user, and the time you particularly care about um, recommending a, a, a movie is when it's a new movie. But at that point you don't have any data in your collaborative filtering system and it's really hard. Um, as I say this, we don't currently have anything built into fast AI to handle the cold start problem, and that's really because the cold start problem, the only way I know of to solve it, in fact the only way I think that conceptually you can solve it, is to have a second model, which is not a collaborative filtering model, but a metadata driven model for new users or new movies. Um, I don't know if Netflix still does this, but certainly what they used to do when I signed up to Netflix was they started showing me lots of movies and saying, 
have you seen this, did you like it, have you seen this, did you like it, you know, and so they fixed the cold start problem through the UX. So there was no, you know, cold start problem. They found like 20 really common movies and asked me if I liked them. They used my replies to those 20 to show me 20 more that I might have seen. And, you know, by the time I had gone through 60, I wasn't, you know, there was no cold start problem anymore. And for new movies, it's not really a problem because like the first 100 users who haven't seen the movie, you know, go in and say whether they liked it. And then the next 100,000, the next million, it's not a cold start problem anymore. Um, but the other thing you can do if you, for whatever reason, kind of can't go through that UX of like asking people, did you like those things? So for example, if you're selling products and you don't really want to show them like a big selection of your products and say, did you like this? Because you just want them to buy. Um, you could instead try and use a, a metadata-based kind of tabular model, you know, what, um, what geography did they come from, 